Welcome to this video, which is all about the mysterious quark. Quarks are fundamental particles of nature, which make up a lot of the stuff that we are familiar with, such as ourselves and the chairs we sit on. So let's have a closer look at quarks. There are many particles in physics and in the universe, um, and, but they come in families. They're, they're split up into groups. They're classified um, in this way. We have hadrons and we have leptons. Uh, we also have bosons. Now, bosons are what we call force-carrying particles, uh, and they don't play any part in your course at all. You don't really need to know anything about those, but we'll, we'll cover them um, for the sake of completeness. Leptons we already know about because the electron is a lepton. So they're tiny little fundamental particles, and there are some of those as well. Um, and then there are hadrons, and there are many, many hadrons. And the reason there are so many hadrons is that hadrons are made up of smaller particles again. So the proton is an example of a hadron, for example, and protons are what, the, what they use in the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva to uh, smash matter together. They, 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 they smash beams of protons together. But protons themselves are not fundamental particles, as we once thought. They're actually made of three separate particles, and those particles are called quarks. And a hadron is defined as any particle that contains quarks and therefore feels the strong force or the strong interaction that I talk about in other videos or that you may have heard of. Okay, so let's have a look at some family trees. On the left here, we have leptons. Now, leptons are particles that contain no quarks. So there are no quarks in the electron. The electron I've put in red because it's one that we're all familiar with. Some other leptons include the muon and the tau particle. And all three of those have an associated neutrino. Now, neutrinos are tiny, tiny, tiny little particles uh, that have almost no interaction with normal matter whatsoever. They result from uh, nuclear fusion and things like that, beta decay. There is the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, and they are associated with each of the other leptons, the electron, the muon, and the tau. Okay. Hadrons are much heavier particles uh, and they contain quarks. Now there are two types of hadrons. So now we've got a subclassification here. We have mesons and we have baryons. Baryons um, contain three quarks, as we can see here, and mesons only contain two quarks. If you're into classical languages, you can remember it this way. Leptons are light because that's the origin of the word lepton. Mesons are middle weight particles, as in mesoscale, mesons, and baryons are the heavy ones, uh, from the Greek words for light, middle, and heavy. So mesons contain two quarks and baryons contain three quarks. In fact, as we'll see later on, a meson always contains one quark and one antiquark, and baryons contain three quarks. So there are many hadrons, as I said, the proton and the neutron are both baryons uh, and therefore they contain three quarks and there are many other exotic particles that are also uh, baryons. There are many particles that are mesons um, but none of those occur in normal matter. So the three particles that we're familiar with, the electron, the proton and the neutron, the electron is a lepton and the proton are, and the neutron are both baryons which is a subclassification of hadrons. Okay, so that's the general scheme of things. Okay, so as we say, baryons contain three quarks and mesons contain two quarks. But it's a bit more complicated than that because there are actually six flavours or types of, uh, of quarks. There are many silly names, many humorous names um, in, in this uh, family. Um, the first one is that quarks have flavour. Many of these names were thought up in the 60s. So there we are. Um, and the particle that you get when you put together a number of quarks dep uh, depends on the combination of the different quarks within it, which of these six flavors you have, three of which will occur in your baryon or two of which will, contain, will, will occur in your meson. The first quarks were discovered by a team led by this man, Murray Gell-Mann, in America in the 50s. And at the time, in the post-war period, they were experimenting with particle accelerators 
linear ones usually that had higher and higher and greater and greater energies. And eventually they, 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 the energy of the accelerators were enough to penetrate the, what they thought were the fundamental particles at the time, the proton and later the neutron. And they discovered that protons and, and neutrons were made up of these things. Uh, now the, the, part, the, the first quarks to be discovered were named up and down because they had various properties that were opposite. Uh, and then a third one was discovered later on, which they dubbed the strange quark because the properties of the quark were strange, such as its lifetime was much longer than that of the up or the down. Um, and then another quark was discovered, uh, which was called the charm quark. And then finally, another two were discovered. Now, in, er, originally, the quarks were named truth and beauty. So you had up, down, strange, charm, truth and beauty. But I think somebody must have said, hang on a minute, guys, these names are getting a bit silly. So but they had to keep the, the letters T and B because everybody was referring them by t, to T and T and B. So they changed truth and beauty to top and bottom, which leaves us with six quarks. All right. So we've got up, down and strange. And then we've got charm, top and bottom. And those are the six flavors of quarks. Now, these two are grouped into different colors because in the A-level course, or certainly the OCR course, you only need to know the properties of these three, the up, the down, and the strange. You need to be able to name these three and know of their existence, but you don't need to really know any of the detail or any of their properties. Okay, so there are, quarks have lots of properties. Um, they have all sorts of different things, spin and color charge and things like that, but you don't need to know about that. What you do need to know about is the values for the electric charge of each quark, what we call the baryon number of each quark. Note the word baryon there. Baryon is a, a particle containing three quarks and the strangeness of uh, a quark, okay, which effectively denotes whether it's a strange quark or not. So electric charge given the symbol Q as usual, baryon number capital B and strangeness capital S. Okay, so here I've got a table of those values. Um, this top row here is for the up quark. Now, this charge is in units of the electron charge E. So E is obviously 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, right? So that's the, the number that we're talking about when we say um, their charge. So we're talking about relative charge. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs is E. And the up quark has a value of plus two thirds of E. The baryon number of the up quark is plus one third and the strangeness is zero. For the down quark, the charge is minus one third of E. The baryon number is one third, plus one third, and the strangeness is zero. For the strange quark, the charge is also minus one third. The baryon number is plus one third, but the strangeness this time is minus one. Okay, so those numbers you need to remember because you'd be asked to do calculations with those numbers. Okay, so these vary, right? Plus two thirds or minus a third. These are all the same, baryon number plus a third, strangeness, zero, zero, and then minus one for the strange quark. Now there are also antiquarks. Now these are actual antimatter particles, which are the pairs to the, the actual normal quarks themselves. All right, so there's a, an up antiquark and a down antiquark and a strange antiquark. They have exactly the opposite values, i.e. the sign is opposite to charge, baryon number and strangeness compared to normal matter quarks. All right, so if we go back to the table for a minute, if these were antiquarks, the up antiquark would have minus two thirds, minus one third and zero. The down antiquark would have plus one third, minus one third and zero. And the anti-strange, or rather the strange antiquark, to give it its proper name, would be plus one third, minus one third, and plus one. Okay. So why do we need to know all this? Well, um, let's have a look at the proton and the neutron and the quarks that they contain. So nucleons, i.e. the proton and the neutron, only contain up and down quarks. They don't contain any of the other types or flavors. 
The proton contains two up quarks and a down quark in that configuration, and the neutron contains a one up quark and two down quarks in that configuration there. Don't worry about the colors. Um, that's a little bit more advanced than A-level, but effectively they have color charge as well, which has to cancel out, so you effectively need one blue, one red, and one green in any baryon. Okay, so uh, that's the configuration. Now, it's usually written like this, just with the, the initial letters. U, U, D stands for up, up, down, and obviously U, D, D stands for up, down, down, and that is what the proton and the neutron are made of. Okay, so for any particle, and we'll take the proton and the neutron uh, as examples. In order to get the charge, the baryon number, and the strangeness of the actual composite particle, you can just add up the charge, baryon number, and strangeness of the individual quarks within that particle, and that's what we're going to do here now. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to two familiar numbers that um, will make sense. So for the proton, we've got two up quarks and a down quark. So if we wanted to add up the charge for the actual proton itself, we can just add up the three charges for the quarks themselves. Now, as we've seen, the up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, so there's two of those. And the down quark has a charge of minus one third. So plus two thirds, plus two thirds, minus one third makes one, plus one. Okay, so the proton has a charge of plus one, which we already knew. So that makes sense. The baryon numbers uh, as we've seen, are plus a third for all three, so that's the same, and that's the same, giving a baryon number of plus one. So the baryon number effectively tells you whether you've got a baryon or not. If you get an answer of plus one, it means you've got a baryon. If you get an answer of minus one, it means you've got an antibaryon, like an antiproton or something like that. Um, and this gives you a degree, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, the amount of strangeness within the particle. So all three of those both of these quarks are zero, strangeness, and therefore the strangeness of the proton is also zero. So the proton has plus one charge, plus one baryon number, and zero strangeness. You might want to do the neutron yourself, pause the video and have a go um, before I work through it. But here we go. The up quark has a charge of two thirds. The down quark has a charge of minus one third. And same here, minus one third, oops. So plus two thirds, minus one third, minus one third gives for the neutron a charge of zero, which again is what we knew, the neutron is neutral. Uh, here it's the same, so we've got, uh, they're all one third, so this is gonna add up to plus one. And again, the up and the down are both zero, so these are all zeros to give you a strangeness of zero. So the only difference in these three numbers, at least, is that the proton is, has a charge of plus one and the neutron is zero or neutral. Okay, now you can do that with any particle. I've chosen those two, um, you know, because they're familiar and they're reasonably easy. Uh, but here are some more. Uh, so perhaps we could try the lambda particle. So let's have a look at the charge baryon number uh, and strangeness for the lambda. So you would do exactly the same thing, charge, baryon number, strangeness. This one has an up, a down, and a strange. Okay, so obviously we're going to have a strangeness which is non-zero in this one. But let's, whoops, let's work our way through it. And we want the lambda. Okay, so up is plus two thirds, sorry about the wonkiness of the lines there. Down is minus a third, and strange is also minus a third, giving us an overall charge of zero. Baryon number, plus a third, plus a third, plus a third. So they're all going to be the same. Um, plus one, which tells us that the lambda is a baryon. And the strangeness is going to be zero, zero, and minus one. So the overall strangeness of the lambda particle is minus one. So those are the three overall values for the lambda, and I'm sure you can have a bit of practice if you want to doing any of the others, but it's reasonably easy once you get the hang of it. Okay, the other thing you need to know how to do is to figure out the charge, baryon number, and strangeness across a particle interaction. So rather than just dealing with one particle, dealing with a few particles where the particles are changing. Now, um, in the Large Hadron Collider, for example, or in any, in any particle collider, 
One of the things that can happen when you collide two protons together is that, you, that effectively the particles disappear from existence and the quarks rearrange themselves into new configurations and you get new particles. Uh, and one of the combinations that you can get is a new proton, a neutron and what we call a pion. Now we don't know very much about the pion so let's have a go. Um, the proton we know about, the neutron we know about. Now when you're um, dealing with this if you, all you want is the charge baryon number and strangeness of a new particle, you don't have to drill right down to the actual composition of the quarks. You can just deal with the overall Q, B and S from each particle. Uh, and the best way to do that is to look at the before and after situation. So before, um, we have a total charge of plus 2 because the proton is plus 1 and plus 1. So we have a charge of plus 2 to play around with. The baryon number for the proton is plus one, so plus one, plus one. So we've also got plus two. And the strangeness is zero because protons have no strangeness. Okay, so after the interaction, we have the following. We have a proton, which has... Sorry, let me just rearrange this a minute. I'm not giving myself enough space. Um, after the interaction, we have... A proton which has a charge of plus one, a baryon number of plus one and a strangeness of zero. We have a neutron, this one here, which has a charge of zero, a baryon number of plus one and a strangeness of zero. And we also have what we're calling a pion, pi plus. Um, and all we do is we subtract these numbers from these totals and we figure out what's left. So we had two lots of positive charge before, now we've got one plus zero, so that's one. So that's going to leave us with a charge of plus one for the pi on, because this one plus this one equals this one that we had, these, these two that we had before. In terms of baryons, we had plus two before, we've got plus two on this side, so the baryon number of the pi on must be zero. And um, we had zero strangeness, we've still got zero strangeness. Hence, the pion also has zero strangeness. So the values for the pion are plus one for the charge, zero for the baryon number, and uh, zero for the strangeness. Now, if it's not a baryon, it must be a meson, which means it must have a um, uh, one quark and one antiquark. And you can go as far as um, working out the quark composition for this uh, particle, but we don't need to do that. That's beyond our syllabus. So that's it. So just make sure that you can calculate for each individual particle the charge, the baryon number and the strangeness by looking at the individual quarks and also that looking at the totals before and after an interaction between different particles, different hadrons, you can calculate the values for charge, baryon number and strangeness for a new particle that you don't know about. And that's what you need to know about quarks. Thank you very much.